Hi, Thomas. Hi, Bob. How are you? Oh, just fine. Lovely day here in Germany. In in Mainz? Is that the way you pronounce the city? No, no. Uh, I'm way out in the countryside. I don't even live in a village. I'm all alone in nature here. Oh, no wonder you're in a good mood then. Yes. But but Mainz is where you teach, or Mainz, or however you pronounce it? That's the university where I've been a professor of philosophy for the last 18 years now. The At the Johann Gutenberg uh, University. He was so, Gutenberg was born in Mainz, I gather. Uh, I, I should know that. You uh, should. I, I just looked it up, and it's true. <laughs> I'm ashamed of you. I know more about this than you do. Well, oh, yeah. Well, fortunately... Fortunately, I had not... a father who was interested in history and always told us historical facts over dinner table when we were children, and I developed a lifelong allergy to history from that. <laughs> so I don't remember any years or names. Well, fortunately, you're not here to tell us about the impact of the printing press on uh, Europe uh, in the uh, 15th century, I guess it was. Um, you're here to tell us that the self does not exist right is that that's that's your view that that our conception of our of the self is uh is in some sense misleading well uh, from a scientific point of view it's always important how much can we explain say in psychology uh with the smallest possible assumption and one thing i think that has been become become very obvious in the time we live in that one doesn't need to assume the existence of a distinct entity a thing the self either in the brain or outside of this world to have a lot of you know good scientific explanation to predict phenomena of course the feeling of being someone is absolutely robust and real as we all know and of course human self-consciousness has many different layers bodily self-consciousness emotional the thinking self um, all that exists and is real but um, i think it can be explained and predicted uh, without the assumption of a thing that is the self okay and and uh, i should say uh that uh, if at the end of this conversation people are not persuaded, or even if they are, uh, you wrote a book uh, for a popular audience called The Ego Tunnel, The Science of the Mind and the Myth of the Self. And then uh, earlier you had written a more academic book called Being No One, The Self-Model Theory of Subjectivity, which I think is uh, published by MIT Press. And, and you're a professor of philosophy there at, uh, university, at, at Gutenberg University. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. Um, so... Before we get in any further into what you mean uh, by the self, why don't we give some um, specific examples of either experimental results or like pathologies or just kinds of human experience that illustrate how kind of malleable the conception of the self is, how fluid it is, uh, and and uh, and how misleading. Uh, it manifestly can be. So why don't you, you start off talking about this, uh, the rubber hand experiment, which some people oh, may yeah. have heard of? Most people uh, know that. It was developed, was discovered, published in 1998 by Botvinnik and Cohen. And actually all of your listeners can do that at home. If you take a, a dishwashing glove and stuff it with cotton and put it on the table in front of you, and then you put a bag in between, uh, so you don't see your real hand, which you put next to it. And then you have a friend stroking um, the rubber hand, which you can see, and the unseen bodily hand of yours synchronously. Then after 20 to 90 seconds, you will get the rubber hand illusion. Two things will happen. You will feel as if the rubber hand lying on the table that you see, the dishwashing glove, is actually a part of your own body. And what is even more striking is you will feel the seen touch on the surface of the rubber glove as, um, if, it, as if you were feeling it right there where you're seeing it. Right. You have to do, the angle has to be right. It has to be a natural angle to your elbow and you shouldn't giggle and laugh and look in the experimenter's face. 
But something you should really do if you do this with your friend is have a hammer ready hidden behind your back. So if your friend uh, has the illusion, then try to sm smash the rubber hand with that hammer. And you will see that you get a completely automatic fear reaction. A person will pull off, pull away the real hand and try to protect it. Mm -hmm. And that shows that the brain, so to speak, the brain is not a person, but the brain really believes that this is now part of your own body. Okay. And we all know this. Expert skiers during a race expand their body image to the tip of their skis. Hmm. Um, uh, Do they, they actually report that? I, I, mean, I mean, sure. That the, 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 the pole, the end of the pole feels like as much a part of them as the end of their, their hand does almost? Everybody can do this. If you blindfold yourself in your own apartment and you take, like blind people, a cane, a stick, and you walk around with that stick tapping in your own apartment for 30 minutes, you will develop a sense of touch in the tip of the stick. You can try it out for yourself. You get tactile sensations. Racing car drivers don't have to look if they squeeze through there between two other cars. They just feel it. And um, my favorite example probably is, you know, that uh, in one hour from now, the soccer world championship starts. <laughs> Actually, that's, a, that's exactly the kind of thing we don't know in America. What I know is that the U.S. <laughs> Open is going on in, at Chinnacock Hills Golf Course. But I also know that that uh, now that was nice of you. you. Did you call it soccer? Yeah, that was very generous of you to use the American term. Uh, right. As opposed to football, which would have confused everyone. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, no, anyway, let's assume I knew. Go ahead. Sorry. I just want to say all these examples where people incorporate, embody objects, tools they use into their, what philosophers call their phenomenal self, the conscious self as they experience it, is the probably most famous soccer player of, that ever existed, Pelé, who was once asked in an interview, how he manages um, to dribble and tackle around four other players and walk directly into the goal, you know, and how he manages to get the ball around four other defensive uh, defense players. And his answer was, what ball? Uh, so he walks in there, but his relationship to the ball is not something he has to control. It's part right. of his self when he's playing and you find that in expert athletes um, that the body image can expand and you own things. Um, we also do this in social relationships. Actually, everybody who has had a mother who was very possessive or a control freak uh, may have had this experience that somebody is trying to kind of embody you or make you enslave you, control you. There's a wider context there. I think we have a tendency to experience everything as part of ourselves that we can successfully control, not only our body, uh, yeah, well, for well, instance. William James, I don't know if you've read his essay where he, uh, he gets into the self and the difficulty of defining what we mean by the self, but he says, you know, family members, he says the self is not a binary thing, basically. Family members are kind of a part, can be kind of a part of the self, and you can feel their pain in a, in a somewhat literal uh -huh. sense. And so on. Right. It's uh, more strong even in identical twins, for instance. Uh, this relationship is graded. And how this went on, I mean, so we all know what the rubber hand illusion is, and there are about 10 million variations of this in the scientific literature now with multiple hands. And in 2006, I had written about OBEs, about out-of-body experiences, which are, of course, very interesting because during those experiences, you have the feeling of being outside of your physical body, sometimes even of seeing it from the outside. Um, these people who first caused an out-of-body experience by direct brain stimulation in Geneva with an epileptic patient contacted me and said, listen, we need some theory here. Uh, and I said, I want a whole body analog of the rubber hand illusion. And I said, ah, see, you can't cooperate with philosophers. You must know I'm a philosopher that has cooperated with neuroscientists for more than three decades. And 
Then I said something completely unintelligible of, they said the brain never sees the body from the outside. We can cause that kind of hallucination. And I said, well, um, uh, what about virtualized meta representation? And they said, you're, you're gaga. Is, nobody can, oh, wait a minute. We've got a virtual reality lab. And then we created an, uh, an illusion where you see yourself as an avatar, a cam camera films yourself from behind, and your own body is inserted into the virtual reality in which you are. And then the PhD student comes and strokes your back while you see that your own back is being stroked. Okay, so let me make sure I understand this. It's a little like the rubber right. glove experiment. So I've got virtual reality goggles on if I'm the experimental subject. There's a camera behind me that's... Uh, you know, taping what I do, and I'm seeing the feed from that camera. So as I walk along, I'm seeing myself walk along. I'm also... You, you don't walk, you stand. I stand. Okay, so I'm standing there, but if I move, that will be registered both in, in my vision as I do it. If I, yes, exactly. Uh, okay, yes, and, and so then somebody is stroking my back, and then the image, and I'm seeing that, because I'm seeing the person stroking my back in the live feed. And then, While I feel it. Yeah, and then what is the, what is the uh, subjective experience that results from that? Well, first of all, you only get the, uh, the effect when you stroke synchronously. That's important. Right. Uh, As so, with the uh, glove. The, exactly. Uh, the first thing that happens to everybody is something we call awkwardness. Within a few seconds, this is really weird and somehow unreal. The second conscious effect is something we call drift where you feel strongly pulled towards the avatar into that direction with your sense of hmm. self-location where you are. The third thing is something rare. It's uh, um, full identification. But just last week, Monday, I was in Zurich in Switzerland and did a brand new type series of experiments in Binja Lengenhager's famous lab where people had the idea now, well, for 10 years, we've tried to transpose the human sense of self into robots and avatars. Why not do it with another living human being? And that works very well. I've just done these experiments. So uh, somebody else will sit next to you and have a little robot with a camera on their chest, and they will just copy every movement you make while you have the VR goggles on and you kind of see out of these, this person's eyes. And that is amazing. Uh, uh, you really like slipping into a shoe or a glove sometime. You can slip into another human uh, being's body. So all this, I think, is very, I mean, you probably know that I'm a long-term practitioner of meditation. Um, there's, of course, a deeper reason behind all this research. Here, the question is, is, what actually is the real mechanism of body identification, of attachment, if you will? How does it come that we are kind of hooked or glued onto this body? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so interesting. A lot of this modern research shows that you can actually change it. You can also identify with a point outside of your body and you can identify with another body if the conditions are right. So in a way, this is conditioned arising. You just have to get the causal network right. And then you can, you know, uh, do a lot of things to the sense of self. So, so conditioned arising is a Buddhist term. So I gather you meditate in the Buddhist tradition. And of course, Buddhism famously asserts that the self does not exist in some sense. Now, was your initial uh, apprehension of this, uh, of this truth or of this, this view about the self, did that come meditatively before uh, you developed it through philosophical argument? Uh, I would say neither nor. Uh, um, so I do practice for more than 41 years regularly now. Um, I studied to study, uh, started to study philosophy as a young guy after that. Um, I mean, I think theory, neuroscience, philosophy, Buddhist psychology, these are all intellectual endeavors and they are very important. Uh, and they support a lot of these uh, things that we're interested in. But um, I have my doubts of people who sit down and then 
get up and come back with a result. Like I have seen that there is no self. This is obviously very silly because who could have seen that? Uh, even more radically, I have a lot of doubts about reports that people, um, great mystics or so-called advanced meditators, if they brag and boast about having had an experience of no self and just pure awareness, because it's the question is very simple. Um, if you haven't been there, why do you have an autobiographical memory? And if it was timeless, why do you know when it began and when it ended? Mm -hmm. And it, if it was had nothing to do with space and the body, how do you? Why do you know where that happened? So, so, so you're saying that a, a, a pure no self experience is impossible to have? Oh no, I think it's uh, certain to have. Yeah, <laughs> to have it's impossible to have it because, because there, there would have would to have be have a self it? to have it. You have to somehow effortlessly get out of the way, to put it like this. And the question is, if anybody really wants that, if they're uh, honest with themselves, it's one thing to have all this romantic, no self ego dissolution talk. It's another thing to really die. Uh, you know, it's one thing to have all these pleasant conversations and books about this. Uh, another thing is, I think, um, to really confront that. So how, how close have you come to, would you say, to the self dying through, 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 through meditation? Uh, I don't believe in, you know, talking about all of this. I think if you get there uh, into an area that the, the question doesn't arise anymore, there's nobody asking, you know, I sometimes call this the refrigerator light problem. You know cognitively that when you close the refrigerator, the light goes off, right? But then you want to verify that because and you open the door a little and the light goes on. Mm. And that's, if you want, that's my personal drama because uh, in meditation, there's always that idiot that has sat down on this cushion because he wants to have a reward and because he's read certain books and believes in certain um, theories. And of course, this is the guy who ruins everything. Mm -hmm. And this is the guy who always uh, tries to open the refrigerator door and see if he's got it right. And uh, <laughs> okay, well, let, well, let me then, uh, if, if you don't want to uh, report your meditative experiences, let me report one of my own um, and I've said this before, and some people uh, who listen to this uh, podcast are probably sick of hearing it about it, but it was on a meditation retreat, on a silent meditation retreat, and uh, I had this feeling that I had a tingling in my foot, and I could hear a bird sing, and I just suddenly had the feeling that the tingling in my foot was no more a part of me than the bird song, and the bird song was no less a part of me. So in other words, the bounds of the self had to some extent dissolved. I think you've referred to this, and others have, as the oceanic experience. Uh, and, you know, uh, th this obviously, uh, uh, as people have suggested, potentially has ethical or moral implications. I mean, if you feel as if other beings are mm -hmm. part of you, you might treat them more nicely. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned Pele. One reason I idolize Pele, he was possibly the greatest uh, soccer player ever, certainly the greatest who had ever played it at the time he played. And one thing he did, uh, at the uh, at one of his uh, retirement ceremonies, maybe the the culminating one, but there was a stadium full of people, and he had them all chant love repeatedly. Now, not oh, many really? athletes have done that, uh, but but uh, and I have no idea whether he was capable of uh, taking the experience he had with the with the ball, identifying that as part of himself, and expanding that further, and and identifying with the entire uh, the entire species or all of life or something. But anyway, people report this. There are people who have apparently done it on a more ongoing basis than I did it. It has ethical implications. I get, is, from your point of view, I mean, you're a philosopher, not a scientist. So uh, phenomenological data is data in, in your discipline, right? I, I mean, in, in a certain sense. No, 
when people uh, we don't words. want to get into we don't want to get into a lot of theory uh, but just for the record i'm a very very strange guy as a philosopher uh, I I'm, have very strong doubts about this whole sexy concept of first-person data. Mm -hmm. um, this is so politically correct, but I think the use of data in that concept is really an extended use. Data you get with scientific experiments in a scientific community, um, and so on and so forth. It is not um, data. On the other hand, I'm probably one of the few people that have has really gone deeply into what is called first person methods or what is much more interesting zero person methods uh, perhaps but i'm i have my doubts of just saying this is data um right. what well, is at the same data time, in the experiments you've reported you have reported the subjective experiences reported by the subjects. I mean, the people exactly. with the rubber glove, it's relevant to you what they say they experienced, right? Exactly. So you, what you have is you have statistics of verbal reports. Right. But the wonderful experience you had, which I, of right. course, uh, know, has a certain kind of, if you take the experience very seriously, it has a quality of ineffability about it because if the tingling in your foot and the birds singing there are so to speak you realize on the same level the same thing if you look properly it's neither selfie nor non-selfie right? right it uh, is actually an experience of silent neither norness and if that silent um I would like maybe call it this pure seeing out of emptiness is there. The whole question doesn't arise of uh, is this now self and, and have I managed absence of selfhood and can I report something? As soon as that enters the picture, you've ruined it again. You know, um, you're fragmenting this holistic space okay, of well, awareness let ask, again. Let me ask the question this way. If I, I mean, you, uh, if I report that experience to someone and they say, mm -hmm. man, you were you were deluded. I mean, the self is is you. OK, so if you didn't have that experience that you are the self, if you had some alternative experience, you are deluded. I, I, I would guess based on your your views about the self that you would say either. And I'm interested in which one of these, if either you would say you would say either. No, the view that Bob had at that moment is no less valid as an apprehension of reality than the ordinary view that the self is confined to the body. Or you might even say it's truer, it's closer to the truth. Would you say one yes. of those two things? That is very interesting. Um, so the question is, I mean, we could tell your friend, of course, that he just thinks you're deluded because he's just so unaware and such a bad observer because he if he would take his own phenomenology a little more serious then he would actually have discovered that um his bodily sensations as such if he looks carefully with precision and gentleness have nothing selfie about it and that even the emotions that come and go in that body um, have nothing selfie about it. And if he was serious enough to carefully look, he would see what you could probably see that even the thoughts that arise do not have something Robert-like about it or something Thomas-like about it. It's just a question of the precision of your attention and the gentleness that you see this is actually not controlled. It's like clouds moving by in the sky. Um, there is a little man in the head. And the question is, what did evolution want? I think evolution did not want us to be expert introspectors and to, de um, to discover the real mechanisms at work in our own uh, our minds. And that, that is why many of us are such shallow introspectors of their own mind today this this didn't help copying genes uh, into the uh, into the next generation now the super exciting question you ask is take these two models of reality one says there's a robust self here 
and then the so to speak diluted model that is more open where there is neither self nor non-self what is closer to the scientific world view right what is closer to the story physicists will tell us today and then i think one could make a very um uh, interesting point that your deluded state may be closer to what science actually tells us that the, everything the more, the more is the oceanic perception may be closer yes and the more dynamic one and the one that doesn't contain fixed objects mm -hmm. and the one that says there is no self there right. because neuroscience very simply doesn't find a thing anywhere in the brain that could be called the self so um, actually the normal state is a very specific form of controlled online hallucination, I think. But, but of course, yeah. uh, even when, now, and, and we should say, you know, some of the things you've described, viewing feelings as not part of the self, viewing thoughts as just passing by, not parts of the self. These are, these are things you, you hear meditation teachers kind of encourage. They're part of, uh, they they are uh, part of the, a, a path of mindfulness meditation, and, and they are in the in early Buddhist texts. Um, they are uh, you know a, a view somewhat like this is encouraged by the Buddha to look at the various parts of your experience and consider consider considering them not self. Uh, and and so that's that's some very very Buddhist. But but of course one one reaction is well okay, but even if you get to the point where you're viewing the thoughts as not yours and the feelings as not yours, there's still a you doing the viewing. There's a vantage point from which you're exactly. viewing the thoughts and feelings. Exactly. Yes, of course. And uh, there's this uh, easy-to-read essay of mine called Spirituality and Intellectual Honesty out there on the web for everybody. And it is important to be intellectually honest. We are prone to self-deception and we are prone to belief systems. And if we want believe what we think the Buddha has said or some meditation teacher, we are, of course, very prone to finding that in our own inner experience. Just because somebody has said a good meditator will soon realize that X, doesn't mean it is the case. So the question is really to be free from all these assumptions, from all these traditions, lineages, and teachers, and go look for yourself. Maybe the true story is completely different. Um, there's no way around really letting all of this go and looking for yourself. And I mean, there's not, not much meaning in being, say, a Buddhist believer and then try to verify these predictions in your own mind, because you will. If you predict that you find that and you want to find that because you hope for what an important Swiss meditation teacher, Fred von Almen, has once called Giga Bingo, so the absolute final reward, mm -hmm. kaboom, uh, and then you will live happily uh, ever after. If you're looking for that and then you believe some stories, then you will find that in your own mind. Okay. Um, right? Uh, you may. I mean, at the same time, you in your case seem to have uh, wound up concluding on philosophical grounds that a lot of, uh, and to some extent on experimental, on scientific grounds, that a lot of these things um, that meditation teachers have been saying uh, are on target. I mean, so so I guess you, you would say you didn't just take their word for it, but you have come to the conclusion that there's a, a validity to this kind of perspective. But uh, in any event, what about the question I ask that I think people tend to ask, like, okay, so you can reach the point where you are viewing the thoughts as clouds passing by and the feelings in the same way, and you can view this bird as being as much a part of you as your foot, but there is still a perspective there. There, is a, there is a you, there seems to be, and I know there are, there are Buddhists who talk about getting past even that. I personally haven't gotten past that, 
but, but, but you cannot, Robert. You cannot. So these, this so was, these, so these Buddhists are wrong when they say that that no, even, even no. that broke down. Even the subject-object distinction broke down, or whatever they would say. No, they are not wrong. They're but not wrong. But you, you will never be. Well, okay, I will never. This, but, but, this but, but has we not, say, No, I'm, I mean, I'm very serious. There, this has nothing to do with you. <laughs> this has nothing. It is something else. I reject, so, <laughs> I reject the claim that everything does not revolve around me. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, let me let me put it differently. I think regular systematic practice, say of mindfulness, has a deep value. Uh, it gets you very far, and everybody who does that will immediately feel it. After two years of regular practice, you know just how good this is for you. And you will also see that there is something one can't really talk about, but which is a little deeper than just, you know, psychotherapy and better concentration and calmness like that. Everybody will see that. But there's also something that is beyond any systematic approach or trying hard or making an effort or trying to go even beyond because that idea of going even beyond that, that is what you have to look at. You don't only have to look at your breath, but you have to look at that greed, that, you know, only the very best thing for number one. Who is that mm -hmm. entity who wants to go even further than that perspective? And enjoy that. Well, enjoy well, its own absence. Who is right. That? So your point is that there's a point in the meditative path where by definition, if you get beyond it, you won't be a you, right? And and so, and so in a certain sense, wanting to do it, desiring to do it, which is after all something that only a you would do, prevents right. you prevents quote you from doing it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and it's the utmost form of worldliness. You know, uh, money and sex is just that's not so bad. But wanting that, that is real attention. So you, I'm allowed that to want real. money and sex, but I'm not. Sure. But I'm not allowed to want to transcend the the uh, subject object dualism. No, of course, of course, you are allowed, but uh, but it won't work. Not, <laughs> No, you won't be there to enjoy it, and that's the 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 whole. You know, the, the deeper thing. There are things in life which you cannot force. I once, one of the most important private conversations I had many years ago, I had once or twice had the talk, chance um, to talk to Krishnamurti uh, by myself. And this is not complicated. A very simple thing he told me was everything that creates a sense of effort is false. That's, I think, a very good line you can go by. If you realize, okay, many things have gone and there's great clarity, but there's still this perspective, there's still this urge to go beyond that. That's a sense of effort. It actually costs you energy. It's a little stressful and strenuous. Now you, and, yeah. Well, go, go ahead. Um, well, I was going to say, you know the question people ask next, which is... What do they ask? <laughs> I'll tell you what they ask, uh, because they haven't let go of the self. They ask... But wait a second, if I got to the point where I transcended this effort, and, and I've talked to people, and there are, there are conversations on this, on Meaning of Life TV with people like Gary Weber in particular, people who say that they've gotten to, a, and describe pretty credibly a, a state of being that's very different from the state that I'm in, Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it sounds as if they, in Gary's case, especially that he's let go of the, of the, the self-centered thoughts, doesn't have the self-referential, uh, thoughts with any frequency. Um, and the next question people ask is, well, but if you're letting go of selfish desire and goal seeking, don't you just sit there and do nothing? Won't my career fall apart? Won't, won't, won't my laundry go undone or whatever? Right. That is the next question. Yeah. And that's a very good question, because I think 
good meditation practice in an ethical context is not something that can be swallow up, swallowed up by the capitalist machinery. It's going to always be something uh, that was sub will be really subversive. I'll give you an example. They did the scientific mindfulness uh, study in Germany with people who had a really stressful job, namely working in a call center with angry customers all day uh, on headphones. And they wanted to see how a mindfulness intervention would help them with that stressful job life. Well, what did they find out six weeks later? More than 80% of them had quit the job. So <laughs> quitting can be a completely healthy and sane response to the world uh, that surrounds us. You know, um, maybe it does something to your career. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe I mean, what I, what I say to people when they ask that question is, very few people in my experience get so far down in the meditative path <clears throat> that there's a significant alteration of goals a for most people it's 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 uh it's the the uh, sufficient progress to get to a point where they're pursuing more or less the goals they have more skillfully with less waste less needless acrimony and antipathy and so on but if they do get to a point where they start recalibrating their goals and say, well, I want to spend more time with my family and less time at work. They won't mind. They'll be happy with that. You know, so mm -hmm, it's like mm -hmm. you, you may be worried yeah. about it now, but you won't be worried about it if it happens. Uh, and, and then, of course, people can get much further. Now, the person I was referring to actually, I mean, a lot of these people who seem to have gone pretty far down the path are actually quite productive. I mean, uh, so far as I can tell, they are meditation teachers often or uh, you know, but but um, but anyway, I take your point that uh, it could lead one to completely reject the capitalist machine. Yeah. And also see, I mean, if you begin to really observe, not think and describe or judge it, to observe the structure of your own suffering, what causes suffering in yourself, you really begin to see how this, this whole world that surrounds us, how this creates an enormous amount of suffering uh, on many different levels, political, social, psychological. Um, this very quickly becomes obvious. And of course, at some point you have to take how would one say in English? You, you have to take a stance to right. what. You, you, you know, but, even, but even that is a goal oriented thing. Like, I want to change the world. I would like to change American foreign policy. But, right. but, 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 but the fear of people like me is well, if you get too, in a sense, contented with things, maybe that's not the way you'd put it. But I mean, if, 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 uh, well, the, the fear, in short, is that if you get too far down the meditative path, you'll lose the fire, uh, the, 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 the activist fire, right? Yeah, I know that very well. Uh, these kinds of thoughts you're having and these doubts, they have come back and forth in my life all the time. I used to be a very radical young guy demonstrating in Frankfurt, and I was always very active in the German alternative and peace movement uh, in, in the 70s. And then you see how superficial all this is and how it doesn't go to the deeper roots of all these problems. And then you always have this, you know, we all have a limited time. And the question is, is what is the most effective way with the little influence you have in this world to reduce the overall amount of suffering? And I must say, I go back and forth. You know, I say, now come on, you must go get into political institutions. You must do politics. Um, I'm, I've just been uh, nominated for a large, uh, high-level group on artificial intelligence and ethics uh, for the European Community. Maybe soon, I think this is completely inefficient up there. It's it's better to sit by yourself and be a little better person in interaction with others. I don't know what the real thing is. Just let go of everything and be as aware and as compassionate as you can be on an individual level. Donate as much as you can. Or if it is really important to, you know, try to penetrate the political institutions and the establishment, because in the attempt of doing this, 
I mean, you will ruin yourself psychologically. You are surrounded with very many aggressive ego machines who have never thought about all these things in their lives. And um, the question is really to see what is efficient and what is inefficient. But I, I openly have to admit that I don't know what the correct answer is. Are you politically active in addition to your meditation practice? Do you try to stop this Trump thing? Well, I write things. I'm not writing as many as I used to. But one way to spend time is like writing op eds and things and spending time on Twitter trying to influence the the discourse and point to things that you are you think are misconceptions that are being foisted on us and mm -hmm. um, things like that. I'm not by nature a big activist like organizer. Um, right. But but, you know, I mean, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist. And so th those are by and large my tools. Well, and uh, this platform, I mean, I use to uh, I mean, Meaning of Life TV is one thing I have. I also uh, run this thing called Blogging Heads TV, where, which is more about a variety of things, including politics. And, uh, you know, I've recently had uh, people uh, who in both cases happen to be of Arab ancestry, but talking about respectively Syria and Yemen. Uh, from a perspective that just isn't uh, very commonly presented in American media. So I do uh -huh. things like that. Uh, but, but you know, I don't want to get too far into this, but, of course, you're right away presented with this trade-off of if you want real influence, it's actually better to buy into the consensus than to try to overthrow it, right? I mean, if, if, if you mm -hmm. know, the, well, you know, the way the establishment works is if you want if you want prominence and uh, power, then the surest path is to more or less to accept the conventional truths. That's right. That's right. I do these things, too. My, I write stuff, too. And we have just spent two and a half years. My wife is a documentary filmmaker making a film on meditation practice in European schools. There's a really a grassroots movement. The political institutions are still fast asleep, but many people do things with children's uh, children on very of various ages and try to support that social movement but i must admit i'm always going back and forth is this just basic you know people like you and me writing something and speaking the truth it doesn't cost us much right <laughs> we say the right thing but the question is if anybody out there ever listens or yeah. if any human behavior changes through argument at all. Um, that's the deeper question. Uh, um, through co the right kind of con conversation, how much does it really change? I think half an hour of meditation may actually be a more profound causal influence than listening to the right kind of argument. <laughs> or well, I certainly think, I mean, yeah, I'm aware I, I, I have the same periodic reservations about uh how how influential discourse is uh political discourse is i i will say that what your wife is doing is i i, I think that's one of the great hopes I, I think in principle if you could uh i not not it's not that mindfulness meditation automatically makes everyone a wonderful person but uh i think on balance it would be a very positive influence uh if it were taught in the schools uh, Absolutely, and and, and and there's some movement to that effect in the United States. Of course, as a as a practical matter, that means it has to be kind of divorced from its Buddhist context, because uh, which is fine. Uh, uh, but but if it's identified too much as a Buddhist activity, um, then it'll run into political resistance in America. Exactly. Oh, here the same thing. I mean, the Catholic Church will try to eliminate it, but. What must not be lost is the deeper ethical uh, context. So something I've been saying for many years is that every child actually um, needs to be given some toolbox. It needs to know some basic techniques like progressive mu muscle relaxation, mindfulness meditation, walking meditation, body scan, the elementary techniques. That doesn't mean that every child has to become a meditator. We show them swimming and basketball and soccer too and only two out of hundred then really join a club and end up in some good team but if we imagine you have what 350 million people in the u.s about if if every <clears throat> if every child 
got just like brushing your teeth, doing sports, knowing these things, got this toolbox at one point in their life. First, there might be two out of thousand children that are highly gifted, potential mystics or very advanced in a certain way. You would filter them out and they might go further than this and be a great value to um, society. And for the others, it might be that they, you know, they, nah, they learned this mindfulness nonsense in school, but later in life, maybe after a divorce or when they've developed an alcohol problem or towards the end of their life, they remember there was something there and then they know how to, you know, access that tool again and apply it. It doesn't mean that everybody has to become a regular prat practitioner, but there's just like everybody knows how to brush their teeth. Mm. You know, it's a basic cultural technique. And um, it also has to do with becoming mentally autonomous on the level of attentional self-control and clear thinking. And I think the political institutions have actually a neglected duty of care. Uh, the state has to offer this to the citizens. They have, have to offer. There must be secular meditation centers for everybody. Um, this must be available to everybody in society because in it end, it determines, um, um, I don't know what the English word is, if you become a, a mature citizen uh, in the end, you know, a more whole person, that depends a lot on having been shown at least that there is an excess to that. And um, I think so many millions of people are doing this in the West now, uh, in Europe and in America. It's really time um, to move one step ahead and put it into the institutions of the educational system on a large scale, don't you think? I do. And I think, you know, one thing it has going for it, in a way, the toothbrushing comparison is unfair to meditation because meditation... <laughs> Meditation can be self-help. It can help you in the near term suffer less. You know, brushing your teeth, I guess you feel a little nice and cleansed afterwards, but it doesn't, like, alleviate suffering in any immediate way. It alleviates suffering that you'll have down the road if you have a cavity. Whereas, you know, mindfulness meditation, the beauty of it is it can pay off, uh, you know, in the near term. You can sit down and meditate and feel better as a result. And, and, and there's a certain... Um, you know, there's a certain amount of, in Buddhist circles, kind of a blowback against an overly or strictly therapeutic view of mindfulness meditation. But my own view is, if you know, whatever gets people to sit down and try it and keep doing it is a good thing, even if it only makes you a, a, a slightly less agitated person and, and, and that feels good to you. That's also good for the world right there. You'll be less an <clears throat> annoying in, in person. And in principle, as you know, uh, the path can go much deeper than that. And, and so I, I think the thing it has, the great thing it has going for it, and this is in the Buddhist, deep in the Buddhist tradition. I mean, the Buddha talks out starting, uh, starts out talking about suffering and ending suffering. Yes. And, and so it, it's this organic kind of connection between self-help and ethical progress and arguably uh, deeper insight in a metaphysical sense, um, that to to my mind is 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 a deeply appealing thing about this this approach. Yeah, I think uh, one shouldn't be so dogmatic. There may be people like most of us have in the beginning to to start this just out of mere curiosity or because they want to be more efficient in their job. It's basically greed and self-centeredness, self-optimization. But if you just keep doing it for your egotistic reasons for a certain time, it might sometimes happen that you stumble into something you didn't quite expect. Uh, it might happen that you have undramatic little insights like there may be one meditation that is a little clearer or calmer than they usually are and when you get up to make yourself a cup of tea maybe you realize that your mind stays absolutely quiet for five seconds or even longer and as you do that maybe it lasts 20 seconds uh, 
you suddenly realize this is really a state in which I do not suffer. Um, there is no internal conflict there. There's just the present moment. And this may show you that there are other qualities um, to life, even if you've never intended that or never looked for that. You can make discoveries there. I mean, I discovery I make is that um, I can easily um, have two weeks where every single meditation morning and evening is totally ungratifying from the perspective of the self that wants a reward, that it is boring, annoying, and just, I think, murky is the English word for it, you know, just dull and murky. Yeah. And that there's nothing you can do about this, even after a few decades. It can be dull and murky. And then, it, something else comes unexpectedly out of another corner. You just have to stay with it, I yeah, think. I, I like to, every once in a while, do an actual retreat of about a week as a kind of a recharge. But you're, you're right, it can uh, you can run into rough patches. So I feel we've been a little unfair to your actual work because, uh, because we're both so interested in this uh, subject of uh, meditation and making, making the world better. So let's, let's quickly touch on uh, your kind of transparent self model is—is is that the term? I mean, I gather. Tell me if I've got this wrong, but you put a lot of emphasis on the idea that um, we're built so that uh, the mechanics. Well, first of all, strictly speaking, our apprehension you know reality is virtual reality. Well, maybe not reality itself, but our apprehension of reality is virtual reality. I mean, we're we're everything I see is a model of the world. It's not the world, right? It's a right. Model. There's. I don't know if you know this, but there's this fun piece on the New Yorker website uh, where they uh, there's a portrait of myself in Fourth of April. You can look, and it's called "Are We Living in Virtual Reality?" Okay. That's uh, an easy to read, fun thing. And the question, of course, is um, if this is true, what science tells me that these are all predictions about, you know, sensory uh, stimuli in the future, or, or all these complicated things, these brain researchers say, why don't I experience it as a virtual reality? Why is it so, you know, robust? And philosophers have a technical term for that, and that's called transparency. So a conscious representation is transparent, if you don't realize, you don't recognize it as a representation on the level of experience. So you don't see the window, you just see the bird flying by. You don't see the neurons firing away in your head, you just see what they represent for mm -hmm. you. And normally, consciousness is something like an invisible interface. We don't see awareness itself in which all this appears. But I think that is just uh, the discovery all these Buddhists and mystics of different cultures have made is that there is actually something to be get discovered there. Mm -hmm. Like the the medium, the, the emptiness, the clarity in which all this unfolds, you can attend to it, you can find it, and that is not something you have to fabricate or something you have to achieve. It's actually always there. But we are like these neurological patients who suffer from something that's called neglect. You know, they, they cannot direct their attention to the left side of their visual uh, field, so they only eat the right side of the plate and they only shave the right side of their face. We are a little bit like that. We suffer from an inbuilt neglect uh, for this quality of awareness as such that permeates everything. And I think that's what the old Indian traditions really discovered earlier than anybody else, that that can be seen. You know, uh, there is actually so something let me, there. Let me, um, let me try to see if I understand it. So you're saying it's like, uh, I mean, it's a little bit like when I watch TV, I'm not seeing the electronics behind the generation of the of the image, and I may not even notice the physical TV itself. I may get so absorbed in the in the picture, uh, I'm not seeing the mechanics that give rise 
to the image. Now, when you talk about our own awareness uh, in that, in, in, in a related way, I, I gather you're saying two things. I mean, you're saying on the one hand, <clears throat> we're not seeing the neurons fire. We're not seeing the physical stuff. But there's also something, am I right, that isn't strictly physical, that we're also not seeing. There's something about about the nature of awareness or something that we are by design normally oblivious to? Of course, of course. Evolution hasn't wanted uh, us to be aware of this, but as one of these old scriptures says, you are of the nature of seeing. So it's neither the television screen, not the guy in the sofa that, uh, you know, judges it, sees it. The process of seeing as such is often something we are unaware of. And I think my hunch is that one, what these ancient people have discovered is that you can actually shift the sense of self or what you identify with from the body, the feeling and the thoughts to the process of the seeing as, as such, the nature of the seeing. So you can, you, know, become, as a, you can become more aware of awareness. In a sense, but it's uh, it's the natural state. It has always been like that. That's It is so simple uh, that, in a well, way, we are too complicated yeah, to I, discover I, it. I mean, it's not natural in the sense that actually natural selection, which is what engineered the human being, did not, quote, want us to see it. So it's not, I mean, if, the, if our natural state is a state that we are engineered to experience, then it's not natural. But you're saying it's natural in some other sense. Yes, in the sense that it doesn't need to be fabricated or sought for or somehow, you know, uh, controlled in meditation. Mm -hmm. It's when you actually stop to meditate, sometimes you have the chance of seeing that it is there all the time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, so to speak, it's so well hidden and so simple that this whole search process itself, um, how do you say, it darkens it or makes it invisible. Um, it's a bit uh, complicated to, uh, to talk about uh, this in words, but um, I think one thing the early Buddhists didn't know, and that you just mentioned it, is the whole story of evolution, Darwin's theory. They couldn't integrate that into their theory. But for me, it's very obvious um, is that the process of biological uh, evolution on this planet caused an ocean of suffering and confusion, actually, mm -hmm. not only in human beings, but in animals, uh, you know, who have to eat each other and live in constant fear of death. Evolution is not something to be glorified. It's a very problematic uh, process, actually. And um, the question is, what stance do we want to take to that process that created us with our suffering minds mm -hmm. and all? Yeah, I agree. Uh, final question before our time runs out. So um, the fact that we tend to be, by kind of default, I mean, at least by the way people ordinary li uh, ordinarily live, we are not aware of the machinery constructing the picture of reality. We're just aware of the picture. And so we accept it as true. That's what you and others have called naive realism. In other words, the assumption that, yeah, actually, this, this bookshelf, this is exactly the reality of it. Whereas, of course, physicists would tell us, uh, actually, if you look at you know, a fine grain level, it's a little more complicated. Um, it seems to me that uh, that that variant of naive realism is not all that problematic. I, I mean, the fact that I am I, I am misled about the nature of my bookshelf is not a problem. But there's another kind of naive realism that enters when we uh, don't examine our perceptions of other people closely and the feelings surrounding those perceptions and the way feelings shape our judgments of things. Which is to say, in other words, there can be a naive acceptance of our kind of judgments about uh, matters of great consequence in human affairs and moral things and so on. It seems to me that's where naive, that's a kind of naive realism as well, accepting the judgments that all your feelings are giving you without examining the feelings or and the way they influence your thoughts and perceptions and so on. That's like a more dangerous kind of naive realism, right? Yes, I think you're absolutely right there. I mean, 
evolution decided we need to know there's a wolf out there, but we don't need to know there's a wolf model active in my brain right now. That would have been extra computational load. You would have had to eat more food. So that's why we are naive realists in that simple sense. But evolution has also wired many cognitive biases into us and many misconceptions of reality, like uh, that it is possible to have a permanently stable state of happiness, for instance, or the most best documented bias is optimism bias. Most people expect more positive future states um, than is realistic for them to expect. And this, of course, colors our relationships because very often we have a direct intuition, this is an attractive person or this person is lying to me right now. And the mechanism is so fast that we may fall for it, you know, or we identify with our tribe automatically, speaking of the soccer world championship again. Um, you know, we have all these mechanisms uh, in us, higher cognitive mechanisms. And, well, ultimately, I've been saying the sense of self comes from the fact that the human self model is transparent uh, in in normal everyday life. And that is what creates the identification with it. These are my feelings, my thoughts, my own suffering, uh, and so on. So from this as follows, if you could penetrate into the mechanisms of it all and make it opaque, make you be able to experience your self model as something virtual, as something that is constructed. Not think about it like that, but to see it as that, that the phenomenology of identification would go away. And that might uh, actually help us also in relationships to other human beings where we immediately, at least I, get entangled into all kinds of stuff you never really see through, into automatisms that have been wired into us through education and through biological evolution. And you're right, there are forms of naive realism which are benign and which are even beautiful, like being in nature and observing it. And there are some things, I take jealousy as an example. You just see that your wife is cheating you. You have a transparent perception out there. This is mind independent. And after a certain time, you realize, oh, uh, maybe I have a problem. Maybe it's not social reality, but I have a neurotic fear of loss or something or an automatic biological mechanism. And then you realize, oh, oh that jealousy might actually be something going on in my own mind. And it's not a representation of objective reality. And then you're not forced to act it out anymore. Although the process <laughs> of discovering that may be a bit unsettling. So, so you, mean, you mean the idea that your wife is cheating may turn out to be an illusion or that if she is, it's, it's wrong to think that she was ever your possession in the first place and that shouldn't bother you. Which of those two? I mean, we don't need, uh, to, we don't need to go far <laughs> down this path, but, 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 but both arguments have been made. I assume you're saying that, I mean, jealousy is a great perception distorter because it leads to, well, it triggers like confirmation bias and stuff. It marshals cognitive biases like confirmation bias right, right. in ways that convince you that something that is happening, that's not happening. I, I assume that's what you meant. Exactly, okay. yes. And it's dangerous. It was good for procreative success to always be a little paranoid because for a guy, the greatest risk is that you could spend, you know, 15, 20 years gathering resources for something that is not your own child. Right. Uh, a cuck cuckoo's egg for a guy that doesn't, is something that shouldn't happen. That is mm -hmm. why guys are very jealous on a sexual level. But for women, something they find much more frightening is if they discover um, their man is developing an emotional bond mm -hmm. to another woman. And that's much more unsettling to them. So we are different there. And I think it's good to become aware that these are age-old mechanisms at work in us that are millions of years old and that evolution never wanted us to be happy. We want to be <laughs> happy. 
but we were not optimized in that direction. Uh, and that is actually what the Buddhists said long, long, many centuries ago. Okay. So we've, uh, we've settled the question of, of uh, we agree that you shouldn't uh, imagine people are cheating on you when they're not. We'll save for a further conversation whether you should accept it if they are cheating on you. That's, that's not <laughs> what you were talking about. Okay. So thank you, uh, Thomas. So, so your books, uh, The Ego Tunnel, The Science of the Mind and the Myth of the Self, published by Basic Books. And if people want the academic rendering of the argument, uh, Being No One, The Self-Model Theory of subjectivity and then uh do you do twitter or is there anywhere online you would direct people i'm i'm, I'm on twitter the uh, unfortunately the english version of the ego the tunnel is completely outdated if you find you throw my name into google you find my english homepage, and there is a lot of more accessible stuff there are also okay. um podcasts videos and um journalistic pieces just find my english homepage and see if okay. there's anything of interest there all right. Well, thank you, and uh, and maybe Thanks down the, maybe down the road we'll have a chance to talk again. Right. It's been a pleasure. Same here. Take, take have a good day. You too.